No, it's just the, the intro. So, welcome everybody to, this is the one, to, almost to the end of this student seminar of this year. So, this is the turn of Moritz, that he will talk about what is going on with K3Net and, and, and Orca. He's part of the group of Antares. Here in the exactly. So, you can start whenever you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that's it, sorry. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the particle identification of the k 3 Torca, so it's called. Okay, first the... Uh, there we go. Uh, first of all, what is KM3Net? Uh, the KM3Net is basically a next generation material telescope, um, which is basically the, um, the northern hemisphere uh, sibling of IceCube, um, and just basically the successor to the LSRS. Um, the true telescope, as you might know, and uh, um, like all of these designs, it basically consists of, of medium, and in this case, we have Mediterranean water, where we deploy a lot of photomultipliers. Um, you can see here in these, oops, in these, these, uh, these spheres here are the are digi digital, digital optical modules, if you've got a word, um, and each of these small dots in here is one of the photomultiplier chips. So, uh, and if we have to ask it, and then the others, we have a multi PMG setup. And um, the detection principle is, is actually uh, on the same map for many of this. So, um, if, for example, uh, we have an neutrino, which we're looking for, uh, has an interaction here <coughs> to, to see that, um, and uh, gener generates a charged lepton, in this case a muon, and it travels like a you know, magnitude of a few kilometers through uh, ice or seawater or whatever, and then it's a chunk of cone because obviously the um, speed of the particle is greater than the speed of light in this particular medium. So far, so good. And uh, then when you have all this Chirenkov of uh, photons emitted, um, uh, which are detected by, by the PMTs, you get hit signatures which look like this. And there are basically two major classes of event signatures which are track like events here on the left and a spherical or a cascade like events on the right here. And, uh, Left ones, these, these uh, you correspond usually to atmospheric muons, or in a very, very rare case, to very high energetic towns because uh, at extreme energies they actually travel quite a bit, uh, but mostly muons. And here on the right is mostly um, um, our most mostly cascade events by um, electron secondaries produced by electron neutrinos for simply neutral current interaction of our neutrino flavors. So we can't really discriminate these. And uh, yeah, then you get into these patterns here that the color coding is, is, uh, um, indicates the time and the size of these distant blocks here indicates the, the collective charge, which is a measure of light intensity at this point. And as you see here, it goes from yellow to something bluish, and we have an outgoing moon here and the somewhat horizontal um, cascade here. Okay. Um, there's actually not just one K3 detector, but basically two sub detectors. There's the high energy extension called ARCA, which consists of two building blocks in Italy and Greece, and the much smaller low energy extension, which we were uh, talking about, is the ARCA. This is located here on the coast of France, of Toulon, uh, very close to the old Ontario site. And uh, because we're so, so small, we're not looking for these very high energy um, neutrinos, not light cubes, interesting, these cotton neutrinos, but we're uh, mostly looking for atmospheric neutrinos, but few exceptions. And uh, in terms of energy resolution, we're sitting right here in this gap between the um, rather low energy experiment, like, a, like Super K, and uh, below experiments like Atars and Ice Cube, and there's one, roughly 1 to 100 GB gap. And this is pretty interesting because in, in this area, you can, can uh, mostly study uh, uh, what's it called? Neutrino oscillation, uh, with which we want to measure the neutrino mass hierarchy. And uh, what I'm more interested in is, is that in this, this mass region, in this energy region, you can actually look for a dimetric signal in the neutrino channel, which I'm interested in, which will be not, uh, uh, there will, only be no, will not be much talk during this talk today, sadly, but it's uh, mostly about the steps leading up to this. So, um, so this is very interesting. Uh, science topic here, but uh, first, uh, if you want to look at like external two events, we have one big problem. We have to uh, know the big overwhelming atmospheric um, muon background, which is several orders of magnitude above us. So, in this analysis, uh, because we're in the low energy regime, we are not doing any um, starting track selection here like the ISKPC analysis does, um, but we're, we're using the, the more simple approach of using the RFS filter, 
because neutrinos can propagate through the Earth, obviously, and uh, sorry, neutrons can't. And uh, so you, um, the idea is to just look uh, at events below the horizon or something slightly above the horizon here, up to here, something like um, the, the PDFs of uh, atmospheric neutrons here in red, and then bluish, uh, greenish are the, the uh, neutrino distributions, and uh, we're looking slightly above the zenith, is something like 75 degrees, which uh, corresponds to about 10 kilometers of water. So this is really, really hard for atmospheric muons to um, to uh, reach the detector at this actual inclination. But uh, you can see that this, this distribution here has not only this this, this big bulk here at um, this year corresponds to downgoing, by the way, not only this this bulk at um, downgoing events at the horizontal angles, but also this this little tail here. But um, and this this reconstructs because muons can't really come out of this direction. This reconstruct to misreconstruct. Uh, misreconstructed atmospheric muons here. This is the Zenit uh, from the drag fitting algorithm we use here. Um, and you cannot see this really in this plot, but uh, these atmospheric muons still dominate uh, our, our signal by some order of this magnitude. So you have to get rid of this somehow. Okay, um, so what we are talking about here is basically a classification problem but, uh, of misreconstructed, ongoing, uh, misreconstructed truly downgoing muons. Uh, versus all kinds of neutrino events. So this is a perfect class for statistical classification, which I'm going to talk about. And um, but about statistical classification, you always have a very large zoom of classifiers and algorithms you might use. And in this case, we're pretty partial to a decision tree based algorithms. Um, there are other slight neural networks or support machines which you might or might not be familiar with. But uh, decision trees have to big advantage. They are very, very um, easy to use, you need different data preparation like scaling or normalization of things, unlike neural networks, for example. Uh, um, but the downside of, of this decision tree, plot uh, the decision tree uh, sketches here, is that they generally do not really generalize well. They, um, if you look only at uh, the data that you train your data with, they look pretty good, but if you try to predict anything you haven't seen before, they're pretty bad. And uh, they are, if you Wiggle around with the data you use a bit, uh, their predictions vary a lot, the models vary a lot. Um, so, the idea we are using to uh, mitigate this problem is actually rather simple. We're not using one of these three uh, learns, but we're using a lot here. This is sketched here. We are um, having some strategy to train a lot, maybe hundreds of decision trees, uh, which all look a bit different. And then, when you have uh, an event X here, um, in one tree it might up in this node here, in another tree it might up in this node, or in, in even another one might up here in this node. So you get different predictions for this, uh, for this event from every tree. And the idea is then to sum all these predictions and into a, into a single value. And then you can do, of course, do something like uh, you don't only have to mean, but you have all the sort of variants of this prediction. That's pretty cool actually. Um, there is, however, not only one strategy to do this averaging and ensemble thing. There are actually many, but there are two major groups. Uh, one major strategy is to just into, um, introduce randomness to the growth of the trees. Um, there are these rather famous random forests or uh, some new developments like these uh, with the very um, popular name, extremely randomized trees. And there's this big family of boosting algorithms. Uh, like adder boost, which you might have heard of, or gradient boosting. Uh, these are basically the, the major players in this decision tree uh, ensemble game. Okay, um, so uh, we have this, this collection of, of classifiers, and we will, would really like which one is the uh, we, will, we would want to know which one is the one we like, which one is the best. So let's measure. And uh, when we do this, this classifier tuning, when we tune our cuts. We want to do this in an unbiased way. We don't want to accidentally um, generate any cuts to, to um, artificially increase our significance, which is uh, like cheating. But we want to do this in an in a, in a objective, unbiased way. So uh, if you have our multi color sample here, this is this rectangle here. We are um, not using the entire data for the tune of these cuts, but we are holding up a couple part out. Uh, we, we take like, say, 50% for just optimizing our cuts and then the rest for evaluating this cut. Uh, note that this is like only on M Monte Carlo, it's not uh, talking about real data here. Um, this is purely an M Monte Carlo split. And uh, when working on, on this, this uh, cut sample, we are not really optimizing any cuts by hand. 
for example, you can't end this parameter at this news value, but it's, you rather tune something that is called the RFD hyperparameters, which is essentially the algorithm settings. Okay, uh, once we are living this optimization sample, we do another thing to uh, get a good measure of how good our algorithm actually is. It's something called uh, with fancy and cross validation. Um, inside of this tune example, we do another split. Actually, we do a lot of splits. You know, each of these, these uh, splits, uh, we have a small uh, blue part here that we use for training of this, and the orange part uh, which we use for evaluating model. And we do this many times. And we always hold out different parts of the models. Then we train our new classifier and um, use the, the classifier to train on blue stuff to predict the orange stuff. And then we get a, a number or a probability distribution, whatever. But we want to boil this database security down to one number, say like the percentage of correctly classified events, and then you get the number, say 90%, and you get many numbers, so you get the average and the mean of this. And uh, if your classifier is it's very bad or it's very much overtraining, you will see this, this value is very low, or in case of overtraining, this, this number is very big, so you have very big variance. So it's a pretty, pretty cool, pretty simple actually, but a very, very robust way to evaluate performance without cheating. Okay, um, let's look at these uh, major group algorithms I talked about. Uh, first of all, there's boosting. Um, tuning boosted decision trees on some of this is a bit involved because the parameter space you can tune is giant. Um, you have many, many parameters, for example, the, okay, this is a bit hard to see, I'm sorry, um, the, the maximum depth you want the trees to grow or how how fast the boosting is, etc. etc. The actual values are not that important, but the point is you get a lot of these numbers, and this is of course means a lot of runtime. This is rather tedious. Um, but they give you quite a good performance. You can see here some um, some part of this parameter space here that the performance evaluations and see okay here and these guys are actually uh, quite good. This one has a rather large variance and uh, it's really just make a scan over the entire parameter space and pick the one with the best score. Um, but the problem is the parameter space is big. You need a lot of optimization, a lot of view hours, so it's not very nice. And uh, I've put here put basically some arbitrary numbers here and you don't really know which which uh, domain it's interesting without measuring stuff. So this really, really takes a lot of time. CPU to the mouse beyond this means a lot of waiting, which is not nice. If you have randomized tree ensembles on the other hand, it's rather simple. There's uh, one parameter which is also um, in this, this, these boosted trees, which I'm not showing. Here's the number of trees you put in this entire forest, and this is very simple. You just use many, as many as you have with CPU. And this is like if you increase the number of trees to something like hundreds, um, the performance pretty much gets stable, and uh, yeah, you just use a lot of them and you're done. And um, if you look at the other parameters for tune, there's not uh, really much to gain here. This is, I played around with some settings. Here and uh, but basically they are basically um, to give a big of a difference. The deviations here are something like one standard deviation or so. So um, this is pretty cool. Uh, random for that means that you can use random forest like uh, just basically off the shelf without any real tuning and at least use this as something like a benchmark. Okay, that was a lot about uh, algorithms so far. So we done this entire evaluation thing, topic primitive, really cross validation, whatever. And now we picked our favorite configuration, and uh, we want to see how good this thing actually is. Remember, we trained us on this set here, so this is optimal for these cards. But we want to know what happens if we want to predict data that we have never seen before. So now we're moving to this set here to evaluate this. Okay, and then you can. Okay, this is not a very good color. I'm sorry. Um, you can evaluate uh, something like, um, if you have a lot of events, you can design each event something like a, a, a confidence. This is here called the score, the, the, the signal is confident, which means here one is perfect confidence. It means uh, the algorithm is absolutely sure that uh, it's a single event or uh, and zero means, yeah, it's absolutely sure it's background. And uh, you might have seen this is kind of before. for um, So what we're doing here is this a classification of we want to just get rid of everything else and only want to keep monotreal objects safe. And you get this estimation here, not the log scale. But there is one problem with this approach, which you can see in this region here, um, that these, uh, in the very high singular region where you're going to cut, for example, you will for example, cut somewhere around here, but uh, 
the uh, many background events show a lot, a lot of fluctuation, which is not really nice. Um, so if you want to give us something like um, estimate that you have a sample of neutrinos and your, um, if you are a bar on your background is very large, uh, large it's obviously not very nice. And uh, there is one uh, simple tool to overcome this thing to uh, improve this PDF estimate as you do on, don't do this thing only once, but do this many, many, many times. And not on the, on, on the cross relation scheme, but something similar, but this is called something like uh, random shuffling or bootstrapping or there are different strategies for this. And the idea is basically very simple. You don't train on the normal set, but you draw randomly from the set and uh, train on this, and you can do this many times, for example, hundreds of times. And uh, then for each of these iterations, you get a, a confidence distribution like here. Then at the end of the day, you just saw some all of your confidence distribution and you see this is some very nice and smooth estimate here in the slot scale. So our background goes uh, down exponentially here, which is pretty nice. And then we say we cut around here and we can integrate over this part here to get the remaining background and this number is actually pretty stable. And you can also, of course, you can um, extract uh, a variance of that, but this is rather ugly to plot here, so I didn't like do this here. Okay, well, what happens when we actually done this with this work? Um, this here was only uh, muon neutrinos, and then um, look at the, all the other events. Um, because we have basically three classes, um, atmospheric muon neutrinos, uh, atmospheric electron neutrinos, and the atmospheric muons, um, we do something here. Have basically three classes we want to separate here. And here I'm going for um, basically a, a one versus the rest scheme. For example, I have one sample where I only want atmospheric muons, where uh, atmospheric electron neutrinos, and one where I want the rest. So I do always this, okay, just give me this class and throw away everything else. And we can see, um, this is the slide from before, basically, that this works pretty nice with atmospheric muon tracks. And we also get a pretty good rejection of atmospheric muons here. Um, they are here in blue. So this is something like uh, the, um, Central 40 bands or something, and we get a background of in this region of like 10, which is pretty, pretty good, very high purity. So we can just cut here and get rid of almost all of our background and get a very good um, estimate on the on the contamination and also an error on this contamination. But uh, if you look to the far left, there is one massive thing left, and this is the cascade like events. Uh, although you might expect from this, this um, Event display I showed before that um, they are pretty easy to separate because the events are basically spherical. At the lower energies we uh, we're at, they are um, not only these events are spherical, but also low energy muon neutrinos are um, in the detector resolution more um, more spherical than track like. So this is a problem here for a train. Um, so um, what do you do? Um, one idea was uh, one possibility is of course that these remaining spherical muons because we did a rather loose cut on, on the start, are contaminating the sampling and spoiling everything. So the idea is, since we can reject atmospheric muons we are very well, we just cut them away and then uh, just do this pure uh, track with this cascade scheme, and this is here. And uh, this is basically already quite good, but not uh, perfect satisfying. We can still see that the muon neutrinos are very reliably identified here, so we have something like a um, Background contamination of of uh, something like zero point uh, zero one percent, which is pretty good. Uh, but uh, if you want to look at very high confidence uh, cascade events here, which are like new eight, um, you still have a significant con uh, background contamination here of something like ten percent. And uh, only if if you cut at very high values, we get a somewhat clear sample. But of course, then we lose a lot of statistics. So uh, this is not perfectly satisfactory yet, and I have to say this is very much a work in, pro uh, in progress so far. So um, I have, have not uh, come out of a solution uh, to this day, and uh, so this is uh, somewhat unsatisfying, but uh, there's always no number of options you can um, try when you're stuck with this kind of, for example, you can go back to the first square and uh, go back to a classifier as you want, uh, ask your local uh, computer scientists which algorithm you should use for this, this kind of problem or just make a broader scan over the entire hyperparameter space you did here or uh, ask your construction guys to get you, give you better construction. So this is uh, 
basically means back to the basics and uh, doing more work in this part. But uh, this is but I showed you here that once you've improved your construction, you basically have a very fixed framework which gives you a very robust way of uh, uh, getting an unbiased estimate of your, for example, your background contamination and a reliable error on that uh, without you really meddling with any cuts and ma manually um, selecting cuts here for an alternative parameters. It was done all automatically here, but uh, like I said, the work here on this part is unfortunately not ended yet so far. And I'll let for you. Thanks. I'm sure there are questions. Questions? I'm here. Uh, you said you had two algorithms to, to check the in, the... in the beginning you had two algorithms, um. right? And you, you choose to, 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 to use one in the real data, right? Um, what do you Like um, this slide here? Yeah. And you, um, up, up, up here, or yes, these yes. two families. And um, then you choose one to, to check in the real data, right? Um, real data will be the, um, a step after that, but ah, basically okay. you put everything, all the algorithms you have, in this uh, evaluation scheme here, and you just in the end look at this, these kind of plots. Yeah, each yeah. of these algorithms make, makes a dot on this graph, and the one that is uh, the, on the top here, and it has a small server bus, that's the one you go for, and then you just. Um, once you're done with this entire scheme, then you can say, okay, on the evaluation uh, set, we determined, okay, uh, if you do these cuts, which we uh, gained on a different set yet, uh, we get a background uh, rejection of something like 99.99 percent, then you use this number for uh, when you're using real data, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you've done this optimization, you uh, must not do, uh, do this to, to estimate this cut, because uh, then you introduce bias in your sample, which is not what you want. Another question? I have a question with the, with the algorithm. How efficient is the, this method? I mean, in the sense, how much computational power you need to... Um, I mean, thinking when, when Orca is going to be running and getting... Yeah, um, it depends. It, uh, this is the event study here. Um, you can see the numbers here in the, the exits. is something like 10,000 10, of events. And uh, so I uh, did uh, on on the node we're working on just uh, the train these uh, 100,000 events and what takes like um, 30 seconds or something like this. Ah, so this is, the, um, for example, if, if you have this, this randomized scheme, all of your, your trees are uh, basically independent, so you can run part and all in parallel on 60 cores or whatever. So this is pretty fast. And uh, obviously this is um, a bit hard to put it in, in the in, in something like the detector trigger because you have to wait for the construction algorithms, which eat a lot of computation power. But uh, yeah, these, these, the, the, once you're offline, the, these fits are actually pretty fast. Ah, yeah, while well, it's online, it has to wait for the data how it's coming. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the, another question: the I mean, when how? you train the system to say that it's really a, a good event or a bad event. I mean, in the sense it's the kind of you start with some sample of correctly, that you know that this event should give you uh, that, a kind of, of course, training this, to the... This is for, we, uh, we have for everything in simulation, of course. Uh, okay, I, I somewhat implied this here. But uh, everything you do here, if you uh, as for these events, you're, um, this is all multicolored, so you know the true, um, the true flavor, the true energy, the true or what, what not. Uh, but of course, you're not showing this this two thing. You're basically giving it a, a bunch of uh, balls and say, okay, is this a blue one or a red one? And then you turn on the light and you see if it's actually blue or red. So. Mm -hmm. oh. But when 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 Orca is going to be running, then you have to be sure that the Monte Carlo that you yeah, use for the course, you have to re retrain all the exactly. All yeah, um, you have to you. Know, you have to do everything on Monte Carlo exactly the same as on real data. That's of course. And if your uh, Monte Carlo mismatches, then you have to throw out this and increase, uh, improve the construction or whatever. But yeah. And um, one more question that they have: they, when when you say that the, the Orca is going to be running the energies in which there is no Antares or Ice Cube, Arca is going to be in the range of. of of Antares and Ice uh, Cube. is basically the, um, the modern hemispheric clone of Ice Cube. Mm -hmm. um, but you have, um, because they have to basically the same problem that uh, 
for example, the user analysis can only look upwards, and uh, the, the normal analysis can basically only look down from the earth. You, need, you can only ca cover half of the sky, and you need a, a part of the telescope in the upper hemisphere. The darkness is basically um, some like like the same uh, effect of like the, like the same detection volume of lights, but just in seawater, which has some nice properties for, uh, for example, cascade-like resolution. Maybe if you've seen these. Uh, Ask you um, events where they plot their their um, not their neutrinos on the sky map, and you see these huge error bars on uh, on cascade-like events. But this is an inherent feature of eyes that they get a, uh, a lower limit for the, the their angular resolution, which is a bit lower here in water. So, but it's going to be the same energy range that yeah, exactly. This is starting somewhere here in the TV range and going on all the way up there until this, this, the statistics is just disappear. Mm -hmm. Uh, more questions, comments, anything? So if not, we can thank more.